Buenas tardes a todas y a todos los que estáis aquí. Good evening, everyone. Good evening uh, to those of you who are here today. I'd like to thank you, thank everyone who's listening on behalf of the Forum of the Progressive Forces in the Left in Europe and we're very we're convinced that we need to have international events if we look at what's happening in latin america we've also had during the forum um different uh, participants speaking about what's happened in the u.s for obvious reason but if we look about what's happening in Latin America and the Caribbean and how important this is for the forum, uh, for the European Forum, the Forum of Sao Paulo, that's why we invited you. For Europe, we always want to have a space to get organized like you do in Sao Paulo. And that's why we have several speakers today with us very important men and women i will introduce them as they will be taking the floor and i'd also like to tell you that the most complicated task task will be by marco consolo who is the international representative of Patria solidaridad and this is the european forum but he's also responsible for the working group on latin america of the european left and he will be in charge of going through the different questions and and channeling the different questions that you might ask to the panelists and we also have to in fact thank the interpreters beforehand for the support and everybody who's helped us um, organize this session i don't want to spend more time taking the floor because i think that the important thing here is to listen to you, the panelists, and also the audience. But I'd like to say at least that the situation in Latin America and the Caribbean is uh, thrilling right now. This is not good nor bad. It is just that is thrilling. Think about what's happened, what's happened in Chile, what's happened in Bolivia. Let us think about the mass mobilization happening in Peru, in Guatemala. All these situations are very interesting. And of course, I don't want to miss the opportunity to share that next week on the 6th of December, there will be again key elections in Venezuela. And in February, around the corner, we will also have elections in Ecuador. So without any further ado, I'd like to ask the speakers to try and be brief, to stick to 12, maximum 15 minutes. And if I see that they're going well beyond that, and if you allow me, I will try to politely tell you that you have to finish. So first, I'm going to introduce you to a colleague, a friend, Giovanna Venegas. She's not just a colleague from Peru, she's a colleague from the left, but she's also living in Spain. She's been living in Spain for quite some time, but she's working at international level. She's responsible for the General Secretariat of the Coordinating Association of uh, Lawyers and also a member of the Forum of Lawyers from the Left. She works internationally and therefore her background is really interesting. So without any further ado, Giovanna, we know that you have been successful in Peru but I'd like to ask you to highlight the most important aspects you're familiar with and how we from the European left can work with you. 
So, Giovanna, you have the floor now. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation, Maite. I'll try to be strict in terms of um, the explanation how complex the Peruvian situation is. It is true that the mass uh, mobilization in Peru has been a surprise for everyone because for sociologists, for politicians, because we had never seen so many people on the streets, especially young people, uh, when we faced such a difficult situation as the agreement against President Martin Vizcarra. This was the last drop. In Peru, since Sendero Luminoso, we had, of course, um, people on the streets, especially those who were um, working on the streets, or sociologists and educators from the Communist Party, and Sendero Luminoso and in Paz led to a situation of mass mobilization, but after that it became stagnant also because of the fear we had to the experiences in the left in Peru. So this mass mobilization was an attempt to change again. Light, uh, especially, Path, especially after the Fujimori government. So what happened in November from the 10th to the 15th of November, which were the most complicated dates? Young people realized that the Congress, that Parliament, was politically judging the president, uh, President Vizcarra, due to moral inability uh, so saying young people considers that the, the parliament does not have the legitimacy to do this because one third of this, the members of, the, of this parliament have uh, claims against them, against the general attorney. So they are judges, but they're also part of the problem. They do not, and young people do not believe that this group of MPs acted in good faith, especially looking at the com Look, situation with the pandemic, we've had so many casualties, and suddenly they see how politicians and authorities are just pointing fingers at one another and they do not implement measures that are suitable for the situation. So they realize, young people realize that this was not the way forward in this very difficult context. They did not want President Mathkin Vizcarra to get. Uh, carte blanche, of course, nor impunity, but they wanted him to finish his term and that when his term was done, they could be discussed. And but the interest behind those on General Merino was going to be closed. And there is a struggle between the uh, Congress, the executive power, the President Vizcarra, to try to cover up their own corrupt stories. Vizcarra, of course, has not been judged yet. We do not have the the attorney, the attorney's office, uh, starting the investigation yet. So we do not know the unlawful actions that he's supposed to have committed, but there's a strong suspicion that he might have uh, committed them. So he is accused of corruption, that he got bribes when he was the president of the region of Moquegua. Before he became the president of Peru, he was the president of this region. Now there are witnesses and uh, collaborators who have claimed that Martin Vizcarra got money from companies that were building a hospital there. On the other hand, MPs also have their own bias, they have their own interest in this. 
So we had, for example, the two of universities. Acuña, a member of parliament, links uh, some of the laws approved by this Carlos government and uh, supervising the uh, universities, well, he opposed that. So there was a law trying to improve education at university and many private universities that were created uh, for profit did not comply with these standards set forth in the law and their license was revoked. So what they were trying to do was to save those universities whose interests were backed up by some of these MPs. Apart from that, there are other corruption cases involving other MT MPs and Vizcarra was pushing to, to get rid of those MPs. So it's a, it's a kind of internal war to expel one another from public office. Unfortunately, the people got caught in between the crossfire and they felt that they were being abandoned. The attitude of Merino of approving was something that went against any kind of defense mechanism or legality even. Unfortunately, we do not know why Vizcarra never went against this um, impeachment, the second one. And therefore, they, whenever, when the Constitutional Court has to decide over the first impeachment, as some time had gone by and they couldn't impeach him at that point, the court was silent. And then we have a constitution that was approved under Fujimori's government. This constitution includes the impeachment process. And this is something in the law in previous constitutions, in previous versions in our constitution in Peru. But in this case, in Fujimori's uh, constitution, they mentioned impeachment due to moral reasons. Before that, there was um, impeachment only due to incapacity. So when there was no result of a first impeachment trial, then there was a redefinition of the concept. The court, the constitutional court with four votes, four and three against, they decide to leave it and they do not issue an opinion. So right now, there's vulnerability in the government, the government that was elected after the second impeachment, the government of Sagasti, Francisco Sagasti. They only have 67 votes in parliament, or with only 67 votes in parliament, they can be expelled again. So let's hope that looking at the unrest, the Peruvian people, deaths and arrests. There's a vigil now and uh, they are by the population. The population is also watchful now and let's see whether the government of Sagasti can stand and continue with the transition period to call for general elections in April and to convey and, the, the, and to have a new president in place after that. Johan, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is not just a matter of corruption. The problem is that in Peru, corruption has to do with inequality. We've seen that economic growth has not been compensated with the redistribution of, with, uh, redistribution of wealth and wealth has been kept in the hands of large companies of the oligarchies and the population at large has not benefited from this. So this has generated some unrest because it's politicians who have taken the money or the elites. So we have a constitution and that's why we're trying to have 
a modification of this with the new constituting assembly and what they do is to equal national and foreign companies and and foreign nationals and um, locals and also this also affects the tax policy and people are fed up with this kind of behavior of this support to foreign uh, firms and nationals because this goes against the interests of Peruvians and this is shown by the authorities, officials and the sectors they represent. We see that large economic groups, large companies have, have survived even before Fujimori. Um, Sir Romero has the same kind of power, this business has the same kind of power and it has alliances with foreign capital arriving in Peru. So we cannot sustain the situation in time. It was due to time, that it was high time that this happened. And young people have shown that they're not scared. They're not afraid. And they cannot be, they can, fear cannot be used to stop them. And they cannot be used um, as fear against the left and against terrorism. This is a new generation. They have not gone through that situation in the past. So it's good that they do not have this fear. And I think that this is, a new, this is a new horizon for us. We have young people who have been on the streets and they have gone to the universities and have shown that they're courageous and they are also socially aware. And I think that this is something that was missing in Peru. And me, despite of the pandemic, I think that we can see that we can hope for a period that might be of unrest, of course, but also of pressure to the institutions and pressure to politicians and the authorities, because I think that the population, especially young people, will not let, let them do what they want. They will not let them continue down the path of this constitution that just favors certain interests and they're going to stop the authorities they're going to prevent the authorities from regulating a society with the same kind of standards that we've seen since independence almost we could say so i think that this is something good and that's it you can ask some questions later thank you so much ivana i'd like to ask you to be a little bit more disciplined and especially so that we have time for questions but this might be this was very interesting and that was very interesting i'd like to ask claudio for permission to have diego first because he has to catch a plane so Claudia, if you don't mind, can you can we have Diego first? Let me introduce Diego Pari. He is a friend as well, a colleague, a comrade. He was the chancellor in Bolivia. But right now, and I'd like to highlight this, he is a representative of Bolivia in the UN. And this is going to be a very important position if we look back at what happened in Bolivia in this past year and attacks to human rights defenders. So, Diego, as you were not here before, I have to tell you that you have between 10 and 12 minutes for your presentation. So thank you once again, and we're so happy that you're here. Good evening, and I'm so sorry, I would like to apologize because I'm late and I'm going to take the floor very soon, but for a Bolivian that is in New York, it's not easy to move, and therefore I'm here to share a moment with you. Thanks, Maite, for giving me the opportunity. I would like to thank all my colleagues from Europe 
that are here in this Zoom that is uh, very important to us. It's important to share this with you. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the role that you had during general elections in Bolivia on the 18th of October. This uh, contribution was essential because if we because without the international observers and the MEPs that were coming from Europe, I think it wouldn't we wouldn't have seen the same result and uh, we wouldn't have seen uh, the same things that we have seen. So I suppose that the colleagues that were in Bolivia have already shared that information with you because we had to wait for the result, but it was because of technology. The ones that were, the, 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 they didn't want to publish the results. Bolivia is, um, in a, it has been in a difficult period. The year has been uh, complicated. We have seen persecutions, difficulties, and uh, this year our candidates were accused uh, about different things. And uh, this year we were not able to defend human rights. We didn't have the possibility to have a freedom of expression. We didn't have the possibility to share our ideas freely in the media. Therefore, the year has been a difficult one and the pandemic has had an effect on every country and in our country as well. The Bolivian people has been able to face the situation with traditional medicine, with uh, self-medication, because the lack of government was terrible. The government was only administering corruption. This is the only thing that we have seen this year. And I think we have um, learned a lot this year because we understood that these kind of political processes, we need to take care of them. And the Bolivian population has understood that uh, Evo was there, but we needed to defend a political process, a political process that was uh, at risk. Not only uh, the government was at risk, but also social stability, political stability, and democracy were, were at risk too. Therefore, this year has allowed us to reflect in Bolivia and Bolivians that were in the country, but also in, in other countries out of the country. The 18th of October was a very important uh, moment. I believe you will Remember, I think you have seen that in the media, that the Supreme Court in Bolivia has uh, postponed the elections. The elections had to take place on the 3rd of May. The elections were postponed because of the pandemic. Afterwards, the election had to be organized in August. It was, they were postponed again, then in September. Therefore, they were using the pandemic to postpone them. But uh, finally, through demonstrations, through social movements pressure, the elections took place on the 18th of October 2020. And I think that electoral point, that electoral moment was um, beyond our expectations. Bolivia has had a very important confrontation. We've seen that in November. 2019, we had a confrontation between two peoples, the constitutional government uh, had to leave, Evo Morales um, was uh, governing the country because of the constitution and uh, he had to leave power. And therefore, the situation was very difficult. We have seen persecutions, as I was telling you, judiciary processes to everyone. And uh, therefore, 
we had seen social conflicts, uh, we have seen uh, different problems and therefore we had to set the date for the elections. As I was saying that the situation was um, difficult, there were lots of confrontation, but it was a surprise because on the 18th of October, we we have seen something very important for, for Bolivia, for Latin America and the world. And it was on the date of the election, we, were, we didn't have any conflicts. We didn't have, um, it was, um, the situation was under control. We thought that in some parts of the country, we would see conflicts. And at the end, we were going to have a, a very big problem. But we realized and we learned that day that the people decides and they are um, deciding and, and voting. The participation was very high and um, the voting was uh, peaceful. There were no confrontation, no issues and um, we, there were no doubts on the electoral process. But another surprise is what happened during the night when the results had to be published. The Supreme Court decided, the Electoral Supreme Court decided to, um, decided not to have a quick um, count. They decided to not to publish it and the court decided that the, the, the figures and the votes were going to be published five days later. So the population was not going to wait for that. The only result that we would see after the closing of the polling stations were the results of the different uh, political parties and uh, the companies that were doing some polls. The results of the political parties were not going to be accepted by the population because they were an interest, an interested part of it. And therefore they were waiting for the polling companies. They were going to be published at eight, afterwards at nine, at 10, at 11. And finally, these results were published at midnight. They published a result and they say that the socialist movement has uh, won the election. The difference at that point was 53% uh, against 35% uh, more or less. In this uh, process, uh, they were trying to distort the result. Uh, this um, was not an accident. They were trying to see what they could do to avoid giving the population this uh, result. Because it was clear that the government party, they have uh, communicated through different media, they have said it publicly, that uh, the socialist movement, that they were not going to allow the socialist movement to go back to power. They said that they would do anything for the mass not to be in power. And therefore, they were trying to avoid that. But the result was very clear. And therefore, that the result has to be recognized and uh, the political party that has won the election had to be recognized. And after a few days, the official results were published. The uh, president, Luis Arce Catacora, got uh, 26 points more. And uh, it is surprising because in Bolivia, this huge difference, we have never seen it before. 55.1%, he won the election with that percentage. And this result shows the Bolivian people that the result is clear and uh, that the Bolivian people wants a mass government and that they wanted Luis Arce Catacora. And this um, shows that the people trust him and he 
has legitimacy to govern the country, but it's also a big challenge. This means uh, trust, but we need to give the people a, a good results. 55%, we have never seen that. We didn't have that in our agenda. We, we, we were thinking about 47, 49% with a 10% difference. In the Bolivian constitution is, um, includes that we can win in two ways, 50% or the second possibility is to have more than 40% with a difference of 10% with the second party. So our objective was to get this uh, 10 points difference uh, when comparing to the second political party, but the people gave us more votes than that, 55% and a difference of more than 25 bon points if compared to the second political party. So we got the results on the, so we got the results on the 8th of November. They uh, got into power. I would, we would like to thank you for being there. Some of you were there. And today we are facing big challenges. The president, Arce, his government has set three priorities. First one is economic recovery. The second one is to implement quickly strategies to face the COVID-19 crisis because it's an issue that has not been solved. And the third issue, and the third point is education. We are the only country that has closed its schools and we have passed every student to the next year. We were the only country to do so. And therefore, our students are not being trained. They are not able to develop the different areas. And therefore, we are trying to, at the beginning of next year, we will start again the education. We will see whether they can go to school or not. In some regions they will, in others uh, it won't be possible, but maybe we can do some remote learning. Diego, you have to finish, I'm really sorry. Yes, of course. Therefore, we are already there, the government is making decisions. We are in office and we are trying to solve uh, these uh, issues that we do have. At an international level, we need this kind of um, spaces to get back our role. We will work on three areas. Bolivia will be back in the multilateral forum. Secondly, we will uh, have diplomatic relationships with all countries, with Spain, for example, that um, we have had some issues, Mexico and Argentina, amongst others. And uh, thirdly, the trade um, trade is very important for us and uh, the, we have to work with the European Parliament. We need to renegotiate uh, the trade agreement and this will improve the uh, Bolivian economy and we will try to solve our economic crisis this way. It was a pleasure to be here with you and you are welcome to Bolivia and we will be happy to see you there with the solidarity, solidarity that we have already always had with different peoples of the world. Thank you very much. It is very moving what you are telling us. I think your role in the United Nations is not going to be possible, but um, that is not going to be easy, sorry. But first of all, I would like to give the floor to Claudio, then to Miss Sierra, and finally to Gloria, Gloria Inés. And I would like to introduce Claudio as a colleague. He was responsible of international relations of the Communist Party in Chile. And uh, the Chilean, uh, not only the Communist Party, but the, the uh, Chilean people, you have had a, a big success in the referendum for the modification of the constitution and therefore it is a pleasure to have you here and we would like to know because um, 
not everybody knows what is going to happen in Chile after, after this referendum and after the change that we will see. You have the floor, Claudio. It is a pleasure to have you here with us. Bien. Muy buenas tardes, compañeras, compañeros. Especialmente para ti también, Maite. Good evening, everyone. Gracias por, por este espacio, por esta you, invitación, Maite. que es una Thank muestra más de la solidaridad que hemos tenido. Es un ciclo que ha estado siempre ahí entre nosotros y que tiene que ser más difícil. Y a propósito de estos días, la verdad, porque mira, este término, además, mm. hay mucho que I'd charlar, like que intercambiar, y esto de, de esta idea del progresismo también es un concepto sugerente, pero atendiendo a las restricciones del tiempo, y espero haber aceptado, yo voy a leer algo que preparé, y espero que se ajuste a lo que necesitamos después, si queda tiempo podemos intercambiar más. Así es que, eh, siguiendo eso y tratando de apoyar en, el, en los tiempos, podríamos conversar muy largo, hay muchos temas. Eh, como tú decías, tenemos una realidad que es apasionante y que vuela. Pero voy a pasar al texto. La innovación, la invocación al progresismo, Advocating particularmente en América Latina, naturalmente requiere de una consideración America, sobre las especificidades propias de cada pueblo, de su arquitectura people, económica, historia, de su actualidad política, de su cultura y sus características sociales. En medio However, de esa diversidad, enfrentamos fenómenos comunes que no nos uniforman pero that sí, does not uniform us, but they unite us. Y el primero de ellos es el imperialismo, expresado crudamente a través del capitalismo neoliberal que hoy atraviesa una crisis estructural en medio de una lucha por la hegemonía mundial y que compromete directamente a los distintos países de nuestra región, incluidos los nuestros, a la que siguen considerando como su patio trasero. En una combinación de diversos factores de diferente origen, la movilización social de los pueblos consolida una identidad común en torno a la movilización sostenida y multiforme frente a fenómenos que, independientemente de su diversidad, nos hermanan en la lucha común del rechazo a la sobreexplotación, al abuso y la creciente desigualdad social, el descrédito social y político de la, de la institucionalidad expuesta al servicio de los grandes grupos económicos y la dependencia, la destrucción del medio ambiente provocado por una economía extractivista y de recursos, de recursos naturales, la, de dominas, la dominación cultural, y el control de las comunicaciones, la represión, en fin, la pérdida de la soberanía y el derecho de cada pueblo a definir por sí mismo su propio destino. Distintos procesos han emergido durante la historia de nuestra región procurando en diferentes grados y formas a estas demandas. Cada día más evidentes y más impostergables, entre ellos y en torno a una década de nuestro pasado reciente, se ubica el denominado ciclo progresista en los países de América Latina, protagonizado por el surgimiento de los gobiernos en distintos países, impulsado por sectores de la izquierda y el progresismo, orientados hacia la defensa de la soberanía, la integración y cooperación regional, la democracia y la justicia social. Advertidamente a la generalización de esta tendencia, la administración de Estados Unidos y sus aliados recurrieron una vez más a su presencia diplomática y a la agresión a la guerra comercial y mediática y a todos los recursos disponibles para intervenir y cerrar el paso a los procesos democráticos mediante la judicialización de la vida política para desestabilizar y aislar a los gobiernos de espacios multilaterales que cuestionaban 
sus designios. Poner en marcha los denominados golpes blandos y de otro tipo so, so para finalmente hacer retroceder los logros sociales de los gobiernos en esta línea se intensificó el bloqueo criminal contra Cuba. La this is how the Cuban blockade was intensified and maneuvers to destabilize the governments of Venezuela, Nicaragua, Ecuador, and Bolivia happened. El, los ex -presidente Lula and y Dilma this Rousseff is Brasil. what happened el also with the legal farce against Lula and Dilma Rousseff in Brazil, Así como la and uh, the government of Brazil and Finance in Argentina, as well as the use of all resources to weaken the governments of this so-called new majority in Chile and Frente Amplio in Uruguay. And a un conjunto de maniobras monitoreadas por el bochornoso papel de la OEA y los servicios incondicionales de su presidente the, they also used para the monitored el maneuvers of the embarrassing role of Mercosur, the organization of American states y promover un and also the situation of Mercosur and the siege to the international integration of peoples to nullify the peace agreement achieved in Colombia and to unleash the prosecution and killing of social leaders and former FARC pero nuestra realidad es rebelde. Pero nuestra realidad ha comenzado a dar evidencia que el imperio no había, que el imperio no había hecho más que cambiar la cerradura a un caballo que ya estaba muerto. Pues el llamado ciclo que se apresuraron en dar por volvió al escenario. Se recompuso y retoma su camino con distintas intensidades de historia, today, of course, in a través de las batallas democráticas y populares en Bolivia, en Argentina, México, y con la floreciente en movilización de México, en Perú, en Ecuador, en Perú, Ecuador, Ecuador Colombia, Colombia, en Chile. Pero nuestros adversarios, sin más alternativa, continuarán actuando en sus afanes, conscientes de que lo que se encuentra en juego es la propia subsistencia de su sistema económico, político, político cultural y social, cuya descomposición se ha puesto en evidencia por los de la pandemia, la crisis económica y la de la pretendida unilateralidad impuesta a la fuerza por la administración de los la rueda de la historia nos entrega señales objetivas de que nos encontramos ante el inicio de un nuevo ciclo que se podría denominar cambio civilizatorio o de otra manera, pero que en esencia expresa una crisis estructural propia de un sistema agotado a escala global que coloca en primer plano la necesidad de surgimiento de otro modelo o sistema que lo reemplace. And that Al mismo it tiempo, leads to a new cada vez somos model más los que comprendemos que, junto al rechazo del neoliberalismo, los pueblos requieren avanzar en la definición de la forma que adopte la nueva sociedad que lo sustituya, que, que sustituya al cautiverio neoliberal, ahora en un mundo cada vez más irreversiblemente globalizado e interconectado, sin que ello implique el retorno a la lógica de los tiempos de la guerra fría, del colonialismo y otras formas de Como siempre, nuestra suerte depende de la lucha y la unidad del pueblo y de los pueblos, de nuestra capacidad para distinguir la universalidad que nos une en una ruta donde cada uno traza su propio destino conforme a sus realidades y formas propias. Los comunistas chilenos hemos definido que la contradicción principal que caracteriza el periodo actual de la historia es la negación recíproca entre democracia y neoliberalismo. Es lo que ha ordenado nuestra política de alianza, nuestra forma de lucha y objetivos políticos programáticos. Es una conclusión teórica emanada de la realidad objetiva, de la constatación por el pueblo de que ninguna 
de sus legítimas demandas encontrará respuesta dentro de los marcos de una de las neoliberal que nos rige y del imperativo de reemplazarlo por una nueva sociedad, por un nuevo Chile, que solo podrá hacerse realidad mediante un cambio estructural y profundo. Chile despertó. El pueblo abrazó e hizo suya la necesidad de una nueva constitución política que reemplace la impuesta por la dictadura de Pinochet en 1980 y tras una institucionalidad que abra paso a la definición de un nuevo modelo que resguarde nuestra soberanía y garantice que el crecimiento se traduzca en desarrollo nacional y no en la concentración de la riqueza y la generalización de la desigualdad, que impulse la integración latinoamericana y el multilateralismo, que sea ambientalmente sostenible y plenamente democrático. Este año, con masivas manifestaciones populares, el pueblo chileno conmemoró los 50 años de la victoria popular que en 1970 llevó a la presidencia de la República al compañero Salvador Allende. Ese proceso violentamente interrumpido, pero no derrotado, ha cobrado plena vigencia en los días actuales en nuestro país. La imagen de Allende hoy flamea en las banderas y es un icono con todas las figuras de Víctor Jara y Gladys Marín y el originario pueblo mapuche en las calles de todo Chile. El proceso marcó nuestra historia. Fue auténticamente popular y democrático. Se definió como antiimperialista, antilatifundista y antioligárquico. Fue adelantado para su tiempo, auténticamente popular y democrático. Se definió en esos marcos, con la perspectiva al socialismo, decía Allende, pero de acuerdo a las características de la sociedad, con un modelo un proyecto considerado atípico y nuevo en esas vías a la chilena. Nacionalizó nuestra riqueza básica, las empresas estratégicas, llevó a fondo la reforma agraria, impulsó reformas profundas y la relación con nuestros pueblos hermanos, fue plenamente soberano y quedó anidado en el corazón del pueblo hasta el día. Esa bandera no ha dado el peso de la gente de la izquierda, sino son multitudes que mayoritariamente no suscriben su militancia, pero expresan las demandas de los trabajadores y las trabajadoras de la lucha contra el patriarcado, el feminicidio y todo el abuso y la discriminación de género por la defensa del medio ambiente y de nuestros recursos naturales, por los derechos de los pueblos originarios, contra la especulación de las compañías privadas que lucran con los fondos de pensiones de los privados, contra el lucro en la educación y en la salud, por los derechos humanos violados por la dictadura y por la represión policial de estos días, por la defensa de la cultura popular y contra la privatización y la mercantilización del conocimiento, por la solidaridad con el derecho de los pueblos de Cuba, Venezuela y toda América Latina a definir soberanamente su propio destino. La enumeración sería interminable, pero en ella se expresa el surgimiento de una piedadina cultura democrática y popular que sintetiza los factores objetivos en torno a los cuales confluyen la izquierda y los sectores progresistas. No se trata tan solo del rechazo al neoliberalismo imperante, sino de una marcha que ya está en curso y está trazando el camino hacia la construcción de una sociedad distinta, nueva, pues la que tenemos actualmente ya no se sostiene a sí misma y se encuentra en una crisis desatada y galopante. En el preludio de la rebelión social, la revuelta o el estallido popular multitudinario protagonizado en octubre de 1919, se encuentra la profunda crisis de credibilidad de la, de la institucionalidad nacional, 
La Iglesia and Católica, el Ejército, la Policía, la Legislación the Vigente, el Parlamento, el Poder the police, Judicial, la Constitución Política y los partidos adscritos a los procesos, del, a los preceptos del sistema han atravesado una crisis sostenida ante los escándalos de corrupción y su complicidad con la reproducción de un sistema que ya no logra imponerse People's rejection. I'm sorry, Claudia, but I have to finish. Maite. I have ¿Puedo? just 10 lines left. Dejo hasta ahí o termino. Shall I, I stop it here? Just 10 lines. Please finish. Así llegamos al 25 de octubre recién pasado, so that's how we come to the cuando sobre el 78% de los chilenos aprobó la redacción de una nueva constitución y abrió una nueva ruta para la verdadera independencia nacional. En ese acto se materializó el quiebre de la institucionalidad antidemocrática fue una victoria de la movilización sostenida que continuó desde entonces y que no se detendrá hasta hacer escuchar su plan. La relación entre la izquierda y el progresismo se ha construido a partir de la unidad del pueblo, desde la base social y en torno a sus demandas comunes, que chocan de manera objetiva con el actual modelo de dominación y discriminación. Nuestra teoría política la hemos construido a partir de esto. Lo que nos une es el rechazo al modelo neoliberal y la forma integral en su forma integral, no solo económica, and as a whole, not just from an economic perspective. This is the outcry of the people to live with their full rights with other values that has human beings and their development as a whole. And as the outcry of the people to live with their full rights with other values that has human beings and their development tight on time, so we're so sorry. It's good that we can have some time for questions as well. So you have to, um, excuse me, all of you, but we need to stick to time because we have to, we need to have some feedback. I'd like to introduce a colleague from the, from Brazil. It's a great pleasure to have you here, Ms. Yara Oliveira. Thank you very much. And this is the second round now of your municipal elections with outstanding results in the first round. So we hope that the second one goes well as well. So dear colleague, you have the floor now. Please tell us a bit about what's happening in your country. Good evening. Well, it's uh, it here's one thing, an important thing, because the interpreters are about to kill me. Each person who speaks, they have to choose their language. For example, Miss Yara, you have to choose Portuguese while you're speaking. You see the, the globe with the different languages. And Gloria Inés, you'll have to speak next. You have to choose Spanish yourself because otherwise there's a clash. We're, I'm so sorry, Miss Yara, that I interrupted you when you started speaking. You have the floor now. Thank you. Good evening. Well, good afternoon here in Brazil. Dear friends, I would like to thank uh, for uh, having invited me to be present in this activity. It's so important to the uh, left uh, at global level. Uh, in the, to us, in the party of workers, it is very important to be here, to meet with other friend parties and explain to you the situation in Brazil and what do we intend to do to get out of this crisis. So I will start my lecture by saying that Brazil is going through a difficult, difficult times due to COVID-19 pandemic. 
uh, well, the crisis has multiple aspects. It's a health crisis, an economic crisis, also a political crisis, a crisis of uh, profound or deep assaults on democracy and the state and the rule of law. But let me remind you that our current difficulties started in the year 2015 with the movements against the then president Dilma Rousseff that had just been elected and they led to uh, her um, impeachment in 2016 and then a coup uh, uh, in August that year. In 2015, after the re-election of Dilma, the Brazilian Congress tried the first steps of this coup by uh, making uh, difficult for uh, the, the, the plans for of social recovery of uh, Dilma to be uh, implemented. After she was impeached, uh, the Michel Temer's government immediately started attacks on uh, against the uh, social and labor rights and uh, at, against our national sovereignty. And they continued after the coup uh, was effective in August, 30th of August that year. During this period and until the end of the Temer government, an, another movement that uh, uh, you know is uh, the, the far uh, right, the Brazilian uh, far right, with a narrative that criminalized politicians and, or, and led to the growth of uh, Jair Bolsonaro uh, power and contribute to his um, uh, win in the elections of 2018. His victory uh, met several interests of the Brazilian elites and interests from certain international sectors as well. Now, in parallel to all this scenario in 2016, there was the, the, the lawsuit against Lula uh, that was uh, later uh, became clear it was political persecution trying to uh, remove uh, to deprive him of his rights and and preventing uh, him for from uh, um, uh, running for president and they would have certainly won president lula in 2018 in the polls he was he ranked first in all polls at the time our current situation is the direct result of those events. A disruption in our democracy, also driven by the uh, progress of the, the, the advancement of neoliberalism in Brazil uh, after the impeachment of Dilma and then with the illegal arrest of uh, uh, former president uh, Lula. These ideas were uh, incentivated by the uh, Brazilian right uh, with the support of the media and uh, in a scenario of economic and social uh, decay. Uh, uh, as uh, PT was removed from the federal government. I'd like to remind you that this movement was accompanied by a coordinated media action to raise doubts about the progresses of PT governments associating the government of PT to accusations that were never proved. The so-called fake news, disinformation were adopted by the extreme right as a modus operandi. And they used the, the same strategy to attack not just the PT, but all traditional uh, Brazilian uh, uh, politics, politicians. Dilma the government uh, fought and uh, Lula's government fought hunger, inequalities, the environment, the in indigenous peoples, the defense of human rights, and uh, the protection of minorities. They uh, uh, um, wanted economic devel development of the whole of the population, not just a few favored ones. And they fought corruption, contradicting the news uh, that the media uh, publicized. The victory of Bolsonaro in 2018, thanks to this the judicial coup and use of fake news was a coup against PT and led to an even worse serious uh, situation that in the past 
and 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 and, and assault against all politics that, that have been developed uh, uh, in the past. Uh, with the uh, coming of the pandemic in 2020, the failure of uh, this neoliberal pol uh, politics was uh, became clear. And in the beginning, already in the beginning, April, March, April, there were tragic scenes of people dying because they had no minimum health conditions to be treated for COVID-19, lack of beds in hospitals, uh, lack of treatment devices, uh, and even uh, lack of infrastructures to um, for, for those who died. Uh, the, 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 the government that, that should have been a unifying force in this fight against the pandemic did exactly the opposite. They de denied the existence of the disease, made it difficult for the local governments uh, to act against the pandemic. The situation became so bad that this was uh, the situation was uh, was brought to the Supreme Court, the constitutional Brazilian Constitutional Court, and they restated the autonomy of the um, uh, federal go uh, governors uh, for the management of the crisis. Now, this is another uh, story that the results is known. Uh, uh, Brazil, in the end of November 2020, is the country with the second highest number of deaths for COVID-19 in the world, the third in number of infections. No need to mention the tragic economic and social consequences of the pandemic in a country that already has suffered from these neoliberal policies in our territory. The PT, PT since 2015, had already uh, was fighting this uh, this uh, consequences, but now they are a reality. And since the beginning of the pandemic, we propose solutions to revert the current um, framework. In our, with our thanks to our president's national congress, we we, we supported the adoption of um, financial support uh, uh, for people with low income to. Uh, guarantee that people stay at home and can survive and follow the health measures. We also advocate that the limits set by the 95, 95th Amendment uh, be, be uh, removed in, with limited social uh, support. In the, uh, and this um, limitation, these constraints, led to an aggravation of health situation in Brazil. Now we have to invest in uh, the recovery of the immune conditions to fight the pandemic and uh, the health, general health conditions uh, to serve the Brazilian population. Moreover, we think about strategies uh, to provide uh, um, income and work uh, in the post-pandemic times. We believe that the uh, union in our uh, in our countries it should be a, a priority to fight the pandemic, adopting a multilateral inclusive uh, system that uh, ensures people get vaccines uh, and investments uh, to fight uh, to, for the local economies to fight the pandemic. We we reiterate towards the strengthening of the international organization, the multilateral system, dialogue is the main means to solve conflicts between peoples. Likewise, our parties have to uh, regain the spaces of democratic debate and not this extreme extremist uh, discourse we have experienced in the past decade. And we suggest that the dialogue with the various sectors of society be um, resumed without any prejudice. We uh, have to recover uh, space with workers be being better positioned towards a new uh, conception of work that we are experiencing due to the pandemic. Hence, we have to defend the uh, labor rights before the, the advancement of new technologies and uh, the movement so that uh, this uh, is not a, a, a drawback. We have to start again, a joint movement against the, the attack of uh, the offensive of the far right, the fascism that is uh, progressing in our countries. And we must uh, rebuild our parties close to our societies and strengthen even more the political representation, economic and social representation of women and the different 
social segments historically chosen in the economic and political uh, spaces of power, like the black majority in Brazil and the various minorities, uh, just like the LGBTI, the indigenous peoples and other uh, ethnic groups. A fundamental part to the defense uh, uh, of democracy in Brazil and in uh, Latin America. Now, about what we are, the plight we are going through, 2020 uh, showed the uh, fake news, uh, gender-based violence, and uh, they've been there since 2018. And but nevertheless, we uh, have more women and black people represented and young people, LGBTIs. We have grown in the left as a progressive left, popular left. We are, we are present in these elections uh, for local elections in the main cities. Uh, in the next, next uh, Sunday, uh, the 29th of uh, uh, November, uh, uh, the day of the solidarity with the Argentinian people, we will start a new cycle of the left thanks to the symbolic elections in Sao Paulo with Guilherme Polus, received with Berlin and Rice on PT and Porto Alegre with Manuela Davila, PC. Uh, shows the un union, the unity of, of our uh, left uh, uh, field. Uh, with young leaders that have inspired and mobilized hearts and minds uh, of uh, various generations and social uh, fighters. Finally, at the core of our actions should be the defense of democracy, human rights, gender equality, the environment, the uh, native peoples and their cultures and the search for global peace as an essential good for mankind. We want to contribute to this with this dialogue to be another tool of this important unity against these times of uh, setbacks in humanity and show that we have hope. We hold the banner of life, the defense of life. Thank you. Thank you very much. With the other colleagues, I think that with the different views, with the different points of view, I think that speaking about peace and other things, I think we have many different elements that complement each other. And of course, peace with the struggle against patriarchy, with um, LGBTQ issues and the environment, they all have to go hand in hand. Without any further ado, I will give the floor to Gloria Ramirez. It's a great pleasure to have you here with Claudio. She was in the Ben Almadena conference of the European left party of the European left party meeting. This is the European Forum. It's a bit different, but we saw each other recently. So Gloria Ines, on the 24th, we celebrated the fourth anniversary of the peace agreement in Colombia. You know that I was very lucky to be there. And we met in, on, in two, with two different perspectives lots of casualties and infringement on the one hand and on the other hand with a certain feeling and I said it there and then when I was asked on the 24th of the invisibility of the Colombia issue. So we seem to speak a lot about Brazil and Chile, Peru, but apparently Colombia is uh, but behind this reminds me of the situation in the Sahara, if you allow me to say this. this. I have the feeling that this is just there and that's it. So the most important thing, apart from listening to you, I think that we need to think about what we can do, all of us present here in the forum as such of the progressive uh, 
uh, movements and the left to give the visibility to you and also to bring an end to this. So it's a pleasure that you're here. You have the floor now. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure from the Colombian Communist Party and I would like to thank you for inviting us and uh, for um, inviting us to share our opinions about the situation in Latin America, the Caribbean in general terms. Thanks uh, and uh, thanks Marcos, uh, thanks Maite because uh, we whether we were together at very important points, at very important moments. It is um, an issue that we share with you that uh, Latin America is living a new um, resistant period because our continent today, in the situation that we are facing from a political point of view, we have an imperialist offensive and is uh, they are trying to silence the progressive movement and uh, the left-wing governments and they are trying everything to stop the integration processes that we are having in our region albert unasur caricom in our region acelac Venezuela, Argentina, Ecuador, Bolivia, Brazil, Peru, Nicaragua, and other countries in, our, in Latin America and the Caribbean are facing dominating policies of the United States. Neoliberalism and the right in power have uh, been very important in our region for the last decades, but in the last uh, year, we have seen an America that sees a new social movements and uh, we uh, realize what is happening in our countries. We have seen demonstrations in Ecuador, the victory in Chile for a new constitution, the demonstrations, the big protest demonstrations that we have seen in Brazil, Guatemala, Haiti, and we have seen the victory in Bolivia and uh, the defeat of Trump and his policy that is uh, xenophobic, discriminating, fascist. He is trying to increase the, the blockage against uh, Cuba and, Ven and Venezuela. And he's trying to stop uh, doctors uh, in Cuba and he's not allowing to get uh, supplies from other areas of the world. And therefore, we have seen a big campaign against uh, peace in our continent. In this situation, uh, the COVID arrives to worsen the situation of our people, peoples that are suffering from discrimination, violence, and the lack of fundamental rights. Uh, Colombia is the fourth country, the, the fourth country with biggest inequalities of the world. And therefore, in this pandemic, we want to create a new developing model to get democratic changes that we need in our country and to help us to fight capitalism and to build socialism in general terms. Today, Colombia is, um, uh, we have a people that is uh, fighting an authoritarian and elitist um, regime and a government that is for war and wants to keep with fear, hatred, violence, and they have the bad cream, they have these uh, paramilitary groups that are still there and they are uh, working, that they are corrupt, they are working with the judicial power in this regime, but they are also fighting the opposition groups, they are threatening all the uh, left-wing leaders, the leaders and the social defenders. Today in Colombia, we have seen that the construction of peace needs not only a good design of the agreement or whether they are sophisticated or not, we need 
these agreements to be implemented. And therefore, we cannot accept that during the implementation of this agreement, 243 X um, members of the FARC have been killed. They signed the peace agreement. And uh, we have seen 55 um, attacks and they are being threatened. Is peace, it's, uh, it's impossible to have peace in this way, but we have more than 1,000 defenders defendants, leaders that are in environmental groups that are fighting for, that are being assassinated in our country. Today, we want to say that one of the main worries that we do have is uh, that we will have a second political genocide. We cannot forget that the Patriotic Union was um, born in a peace agreement and it was uh, dismantled with um, the killing of many militants. And today what we see is uh, the same thing that we are seeing with the new party of the FARC, the Rozas, the new alternative force that has had 243 militants killed and many of them are being threatened. Therefore, the we need an international level. We need to denounce the reality that we are facing in Colombia. There is a big contradiction between what it is uh, being said by the president of the Republic and what he is doing in our country. And therefore, dear colleagues and friends, we would like to denounce, we would like to share with you this information. We have seen massacres as the one we had in previous years. We thought that we would never see that again. Today, 71 massacres in this year, in 2020. It is not, we are in the middle of a war. We are killing many people. And therefore, because, and also because of the pandemic, most of the public power is uh, in the hands of the president. More than 200 decrees that have not been controlled by the Congress of the Republic. A president, an executive power that today has, uh, has also occupied the control, organized, la, la prosecutors and the people defended. Therefore, we are in the hands of the media. And as you know, today in our country, they are being used by these economic groups and they are against peace. That's why it is very important to share with you this information. And it is important for you to share this information in other groups. We have uh, data, we have figures and uh, we need to fight the information shared by the government. Communists, in this situation, we would like to tell you that we want to fight for a democratic solution, a popular solution that is being aggravated because of the pandemic. We would like uh, to defend the life, the basic income reactivation measures that are based on employment. We want to support SMEs. We have also a student movement, the groups, the reform of the, of the system, the respect of the peace agreement without obstacles and the need to create a dialogue with the different groups. We cannot have uh, the measures that we are seeing today. We need important changes. And therefore, we propose a political alliance, social and cultural alliance, women, gender, that it will fight is, uh, against fascism. We are going to defend life, the peace agreements, the integral system for justice and reparation that is something key in our peace process. And um, the far right, Alvaro Uribe and his people are attacking all the time because they want to change uh, 
the main ideas, they want to substitute it with a big Supreme Court. This is what they are saying in a referendum that they want to organize in our country. We believe that we need to find that democratic way out of the crisis. We need a reconstruction of a country. We need justice at different levels and we need to build a democratic project the social basis is the demonstrations that we see. We have seen big demonstrations. They started last year in November, and we have seen that in February. And uh, during the pandemic, we didn't see them, but today we are seeing them again. We are fighting in the streets. And we have been uh, together with the students, the indigenous peoples, they are against war, against the killings that are taking place, but also they are against how the government is not respecting the agreements that were signed. Women, we were also in the street because we want to fight a violence against women. We have seen that during the pandemic, the gender violence has increased. And we are also asking to organize uh, trials against this gender violence that we have seen in our country. The strategy, the strategy that we are following is a unity. We want to build a new political and social climate that has uh, deteriorated a lot in the last uh, days. We are calling for unity and uh, for the next uh, elections that will take place in 2022, we are reorganizing the political map because in, in the last elections we were the second political party with uh, Colombia Humana with Gustavo Petro and we would like to get organized again to be able to uh, be in power and to promote the changes that this country needs. We want to reorganize this. We will have the same parties, the right parties, they are, being re they are reorganizing too. We have seen a few weeks uh, ago the uh, separation of the EU party, Roy Barreras and Armando Benedetti today they are defending the peace process and they are no longer in the parties that they were before. And Armando Benedetti wants to support Colombia Humana with Gustavo Petro. But also the Alternative Democratic Poll is a left-wing party, is being reorganized. And they have also a political separation and people from Moire, Jorge Enrique Robledo, have uh, created a new group. Therefore, all uh, the sectors are unified with uh, this uh, proposal, with a popular group that we want to create. But the right uh, parties are not, um, are also taking measures and they are trying to present themselves as the best uh, option with uh, Jorge, Sergio Fajardo, and uh, this uh, shows that we need to work all together for the unity of these alternative, se alternative sectors to move forward. And to finish, I would like to tell you what are the obstacles that we are facing in Colombia. One of the obstacles is linked to this reorganization of uh, violence in our country. When they abandoned uh, weapons, we have seen new groups, new illegal groups, with dissidents from the FARC, but also the right-wing parties were trying to stop the peace process. It is clear Humberto Martinez, the former prosecutor, wanted to condemn Jesus Sanchez, who was a member of the FARC, and Ivan Márquez, 
he wanted to extradite them to the United States, but his main objective was to stop the peace process. All these facts, dear colleagues, shows that we need international solidarity. Our government only cares about international opinion, and therefore we need that uh, we need this um, relation of um, powers because he had a clear position on the peace agreement and uh, maybe we could put pressure to see that. And also we need to work hard for Venezuela to promote alternative forces. And uh, on the next 6th of December, I hope we will win again in Venezuela and we will be able to strengthen the changes that we are seeing in Latin America to go back to the progressive forces and to the left as the main pillar of our region. Therefore, dear colleagues, with all this uh, information, I would like to finish. And I would like to tell you that in Colombia, women in the last uh, four years, we finished today the fourth mission of verification that we have the International Federation to see the implementation of the gender agreement and the conclusion that we've reached is that there is a big gap between the implementation of the general agreement and the gender measures. 42% of the gender measures have um, didn't start in this country, have not been uh, initiated in this country, and it, it, the implementation is very low. You have to stop, Gloria, I'm so sorry. And I would like to tell you that with uh, these elements, we consider that peace in Colombia will be the peace in the region. We need political will and social transformation. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm so sorry, but we have 25 minutes left. I would like to leave the world to Marco Consolo, who is the, the one who is putting the question and who is going to close the session today. Thank you very much. Of course, I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank all the speakers and all those uh, listening via Zoom or other platforms. And therefore, I'd like to summarize uh, the different issues and the different worries that you have shared with us. First of all, I would like to highlight what some colleagues were saying. This, uh, the, the resistance of the different peoples to the neoliberal measures that we have seen with the right-wing um, government. I don't know whether you agree that we are seeing an offensive. We have uh, young people, students, women, they are back on the streets and therefore this would be the first uh, idea or the first uh, block the second one would be Bolivia. There is a specific question about the role of the armed forces and the police, not only during the coup, but from now on, what is going to happen? And this question is to try to understand the main ideas of the new government on the forced, um, armed forces and the police. Also, the political space, another worry is on the integration, the continental integration. We know that it has been dismantled. UNASUR, CELAC, all that, uh, all, uh, what Gloria was saying. What, are, what do you think about the, the regional integration? And uh, last but not least, the common agenda. We need solidarity, but how can we create a common alliance and a common agenda between Latin America and Europe with some priorities? We were talking about peace and the fight for peace, of course, about the peace agreement. I would like to remind you that Colombia is a global member of, the, of NATO, and therefore 
NATO is also in the Latin American continent, and therefore it is a common struggle. The second issue that you have mentioned is uh, the, the COVID uh, impact and some of the proposals that you have made, some of the ideas, the basic income, the fight for employment. Of course, uh, this is a common struggle that we have in Europe, and maybe we can um, talk about it a little bit more. And the last point that uh, you mentioned is the uh, free trade agreement. Diego Pari was talking about uh, the free trade agreements with the European Union, uh, with Bolivia, but we would also like to remind you that we are organizing a campaign against these treaties, and especially in the case of Chile and Colombia, because we want to defend uh, human rights. We have the clause in the treaties and it is not being respected. That's all because um, there are many th things. And uh, that's all I wanted to uh, summarize. And I would like to ask you to be brief because uh, there are many of you who have to take the floor. Thank you very much. Are we going to keep the same order? Maybe we could ask Joanna, Diego, etc. and follow the same order. You know, you do not have to answer everything. You can just choose to answer one or the other. So, Marco, I thought that you we're going to address some of the questions to some to each of the speakers can i have a few minutes to organize and gather my thoughts yes who wants to take the floor misiara claudio diego otherwise i can speak i think that we all agree that right now we're having this popular backlash and uh, women and young people are playing a key role, but also indigenous peoples. They're very important in this process. I think that in the process of regional integration, we have to think about this. We've seen changes in the region. And Bolivia already mentioned how this important this is. And we are going to continue working in this line because we think that this process of regional integration is the only thing that will give us an opportunity to have a continental front against the North American empire. And likewise, we have a common agenda. And this has some links with Europe. One of them has to do with the peace struggle. In the particular case of Colombia, we'll have to uh, continue struggling so that NATO comes out of a territory. You know, that Colombia, that they're still here, NATO's still here because they're using some pretext to have that, to be present here, and they have the fourth fleet here as a threat to Venezuela. So we have to generate solidarity and establish alliances between the European continent and the American continent, uh, progressive forces. But as I was saying, we have to fight for life and also fight for democracy. We've seen how in our countries, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Peru, we've seen the repression of the social struggle and how this is still criminalized. So we have to also work with the media. And this is, we need to have an alternative network of media outlets. Outlets. We see how Telesur is getting deactivated from our country, in our countries, and we need to really foster a network of progressive movements to show this other vision, the other side of the coin. And then regarding COVID-19 and its impact, 
we agree that COVID has shed some light on all inequalities. It's shown what um, capitalism has meant and its neoliberal model means. So we have to continue fighting the fight so that we have public health systems for all and that uh, health is not seen as a commodity, but as a right. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Claudia, Miss Yara? Now, speaking about people fighting in the street in Brazil during the pandemic, we saw hand in hand important uprisings by the black population. In the last street demonstrations, with the Bolsonaro government, we also had a strong anti-racist fighting with black people bearing the flag and holding the flag and many people fighting against racism. That's a new reality of social fighting in Brazil and it's very important because black people are the majority of the population in Brazil and are completely excluded from political power, economic power, and are the main objects of violence, especially state violence, especially as regards young black people. So there's an interesting movement as regarding political parties, because in this first round of 2020 elections, we saw that we had black people um, coming forward to be elected and that was due to successful court actions in Brazil to guarantee financing of black candidates in different states and representing different political parties. So this element of race will help increase representation of black people in our institutions and especially black women. Black women had a big role to play in these public showings of uh, demonstrations. Also police in Brazil. It's police that sustained the storyline and neo-fascist story of Bolsonaro more than the armed forces, more than the army, those who are supporting Bolsonaro from a social point of view are the police forces, especially the military police. So it's obvious that we have states governed by PT and progressive parties. We have dialogue, better quality policies for the police, but it's still a challenge, the police, in fighting fascism, because we have a police which is uh, not the best in terms of uh, human rights and defending life, and so sometimes they are just agents of violence, and they are those who um, fight the most uh, excluded people in society. As regards peace and a common agenda, democracy is something which should be common to both continents, Europe and Latin America, and the growth in right-wing politics has been a way of attacking our democracies. So we have to rethink of defending movements that defend democracy in different forms. We have to uh, make our democracy stronger, more than that representative democracy, so that it become, become a full democracy, full-bodied democracy to defend our rights, to defend women, to defend 
black people in our country. More than 50% of the population in Brazil are women, but have less than 15% political representation in parliaments and governments, in states and in positions of power. So we need substantive democracy. Finally, it's essential to think about a new element, which is communication which has become important in the last 10 years, the social media. Our political parties have to channel a lot of effort to face the topic of the social network, the new technologies. So we have to make them more human. We have to face and combat fake news and all that storyline, which we call in Brazil as uh, wasteland in terms of news coming from, uh, fake news coming from the social media. So we'd have an organized project to fight this fake news. So we have to think how we're going to communicate over the next 10 years, because that will lay down the rules and that will have a, a role to play in elections in the future new technologies communication the way we use we use social media the, the social networks can also be used to attack democracy so we have to be aware of that so we have to think about this in terms of how to deal with the communication in a different way finally brazil is a strategic country for peace in the american continent in our governments, we always had PT, the Workers' Party. We were always trying to mediate international conflicts. So we are concerned with what is going on in Venezuela. We know that the government of Bolsonaro, together with the Trump administration, can still continue with its threats and initiatives and attack sovereignty in Venezuela, undermining the peace of our people in South America. That topic is very important for us, and we have to face it collectively by supporting each other. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sierra. Before I give the floor back to Claudia, Claudia and Giovanna, I'd like to go back to this topic of the media. This is a key aspect, as well as the situation in Venezuela and the elections in the upcoming elections in Venezuela. In Europe, we are undertaking a campaign for the European recognition of the process and the result. So I'll now give the floor to Claudio. Ahí sí. Bueno, gracias, Marco. Okay, Mira, thank you so eh, much, Marco. Yo sin repetir porque coincido con todo lo que hemos intercambiado. Solo podría agregar un par de comentarios. Said, el primero es que a propósito de lo que tú mencionabas, like a que tú me habías sobre lo que denominaste la contraofensiva popular. With what you designated ¿no? en, as a counteroffensive, people's counteroffensive. I think that aquí, all countries Fortuna, in the region, hemos visto, eh, and not only here, we have seen actores, how new actors eh, have appeared, social actors, that are pushing for political una, change. Una que and this is pasado. far stronger than El what it was in the in past. Periodo, no so in, in this period, I'm not speaking just about the past few months, the, the importance, as eh, I was saying, in the recent past of the struggle against patriarchy, or, for example, y los the originales. presence of migrants and eh, First Nations. La Indigenous peoples have been Chile, remarkable. Also, the presence of young people, at least in Chile. Se de la lucha and there was a point, there was a time when they wanted to stay outside eh, of the political struggle, but now they're the key actors, they're the main players. 
Another aspect has to do with the environment. Social de la transformación. Hace años todos escuchamos esto que nos decían: se acabó la lucha de clases, terminaron las grandes causas. La vida de no que eso era una soberana. Solo que esa lucha de clases hoy día es más compleja. En Chile se hemos visto, y no solo en Chile, manifestaciones callejeras de la comunidad científica, que no era precisamente un actor de la agitación social contra la privatización del conocimiento. En fin, han surgido, han sido fortalecidos y se han puesto junto a otros sectores. Es la lucha de clases que hoy día se ha enriquecido, se ha complejizado y en buena hora. En buena hora. Eh, a partir de eso, yo asocio con esta idea de, de, de la contraofensiva a un proceso I think that this idea of a counteroffensive has to do with the process of restructuring político. of the en political Chile, scenario as a whole. In Chile, at least, visto, Marco, there's a generalized cerca, crisis, eh, maybe you've seen this up and close, in political parties and so-called no? traditional eh, political parties. Su caída, pero ha sido en the la fall has been por fortuna, lo digo en el caso de nuestro mundo, a todos nos golpea, porque desde la derecha, una vez que ellos se vieron involucrados, fueron todos unos políticos, ¿no? Entonces, es una derecha que procura ser apolíticos, pero es para mantener el sistema. Versus lo que nosotros hemos visto, que es una nueva forma de hacer la política desde el movimiento social. Donde tenemos presencia. And Por fortuna, eso lo no ha reconocido el pueblo respecto a GDP diferenciando, pero tenemos mucho más que avanzar. ¿no? Porque nosotros tenemos una concepción distinta de la política. Bueno, no quiero hablar en eso, pero creo que eso es sustantivo. Y lo segundo, en torno a esta reestructuración, en nuestra propia estructura mental, con la que asimilamos la realidad, porque ahora, a diferencia de lo ocurrido por muchos años nos right encontramos now, ante una crisis que es global y que es estructural. O sea, no es un país más que otro país. En el intercambio del Foro de Sao Paulo, se mencionaba, decía, hoy de esta nadie sale solo. A propósito de lo que decía Gloria también sobre, sobre la, la solidaridad y el valor que adquiere. ¿no? La solidaridad. O sea, nosotros sabemos que si en Chile so logramos una victoria y constituimos un gobierno que impulse Chile, transformaciones de fondo, nos va a pasar lo mismo que han hecho con Venezuela, con, con todos los demás que han procurado hoy lo que nos hicieron a nosotros años atrás. Y el único ser que te defiende de eso no es militar. The only el principal es político. Y eso no lo logra un país solo. Es decir, necesitamos hoy en esa re reformulación, contraofensiva, reestructuración, de generar una correlación de fuerzas continentales para superar el problema de la Y en esa perspectiva, y termino ahí, es que mira, Chile tiene 29 tratados de libre comercio con 46 economías del mundo. Todos, por supuesto, dictados desde donde todos sabemos, es decir, pero el tema entonces es que tenemos que construir una integración latinoamericana en que no podemos aislarnos, pero necesitamos renegociar, todos esos tratados y para eso también necesitamos una cooperación, así como están hay, we need to have no es solo el tema de los derechos humanos, Marco, son muchos. En This otros de las comunicaciones que tú mencionas, ¿no? eh, de la propiedad well. intelectual, el tema de los medicamentos, son cuestiones sensibles. En el fondo drugs. se trata de que, claro, topics. hoy día esos acuerdos con otros países And van a estar bajo una normativa internacional que necesitamos cambiar. A partir de eso, perdón, a partir de eso, este, eh, nosotros, claro, 
temas como la lucha and por la vida, la paz, course, la integración y la autodeterminación son life, clave and eh, sovereignty, que nos van a permitir superar eh, la intervención, la injerencia que está prendiéndose de nuestras cabezas. Eh, entonces, eh, esa es nuestra agenda común. Y yo creo que la realidad agenda, nos encuentra cada día más, más allá de los distintos signos que hay. This is, of course, part of our struggles. Thank you, Claudio. I'll give the floor to Giovanna. But this concern that Claudio was underlying, this anti-party, anti-politics movement, I think that in Peru you've had that as well, Giovanna. And I also would like to thank the colleague from Hungary, sending his greetings and uh, speaking about the elections in Venezuela. You have the floor, Giovanna. I'd like to go back to this idea of a counter offensive of the people. I think that this is what we see in Chile, our sister country, and we felt the energy in Peru, and this has helped break away from fear to demonstrate. And of course, we've also had an important impact from the Bolivian uh, elections. This has showed us that we can choose a government and that this government can work for the people. So I think that the left and the political, the progressive political parties in Latin America are showing their credibility. And this credibility had been lost in the past due to corruption, due to the poor image that politicians had conveyed in the media. So I think that all these things are helping us, all these experiences are helping us, and I hope that they continue. And regarding the importance of the struggle for peace and struggle for life, I'd like to go back to an important item, which has to do with our need to educate others and to create awareness, not just with the people, but also with the armed forces, uh, because otherwise everything is in the air. And we see that even left-wing governments have not been capable of conveying these values to those forces so they have to understand that power emanates from the people so the armed forces are not there to support authoritarian governments or those who are attacking or who are um, expropriating the wealth of the people and i think that this is something that we can see in bolivia a process that we can see in bolivia and maybe in Mexico, I think that this is a question that has to be an item that has to be in our agenda. Apart from that, COVID, it was of course a very difficult situation for all societies, but it has also helped us rethink or even revitalize the values that we had as a society. In Peru or in Spain, we see that the influence of capitalism and neoliberalism and the influence of individualistic views over the commons had had such a strong impact that when we had to face this pandemic, we realized that either we come out together or we perish alone. And this is how people understand the, and strengthen their ideas in terms of social aspects and to understand the ideology of communist and left-wing parties. So I think that in this sense, we've had a chance, we have a chance now to uh, make progress with this event, which is of course unfortunate. And regarding free trade agreements, the only thing I'd like to say is that we really have to think 
about uh, an equal footing to develop them in an equal and an equal footing from the perspective of Europe and from the perspective of Latin America, because many times there's this patronizing view from Europe saying, oh, we'll go to uh, Latin America, we'll go to Bolivia, and we'll demand that they have to comply with human rights clauses, but it is us Europeans um, and the European Union who doesn't respect the life to non-interference in the affairs of third countries. So we have to be critical both ways. This has to work both ways. These treaties can only be used as mutual aid if both parties are equally treated in a spirit of mutual benefit and mutual demands. We cannot have these treaties just to uh, introduce sanctions to a government when we're not interested in their policies or to um, create imbalances in governments in other countries. And a final point, I think that the global agenda, or global agenda 2020 has to be not just about the treaties, but about the general um, foreign affairs policy of the European Union and what kinds of impact it has abroad in developing countries. So thank you once again for the invitation and for sharing this time with you. And um, well, uh, Merry Christmas and now that we're at it. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ivana. I'd like to thank the interpreters, of course, for their work. They've helped us communicate and be understood around the world. I'd like to go back to what you were saying and uh, very, very important points. And also the need to campaign against so, quote unquote sanctions. And uh, this is happening especially to Cuba, Venezuela and some other countries. And of course, we have to stop the lawfare the, instead of warfare, legal warfare. And that's all from me. I'd like to thank you very much from this very interesting discussion. And I hope that we continue working together. Rest assured that the European left is going to follow up all these topics that we have discussed and the joint agenda that we have identified here and in other spaces. So that's all from me. Thank you very much, Maite. Is there anything you'd like to say? Just to say that the forum of the European left and progressive forces are the ones organizing this event. And we're very grateful tomorrow morning we will have Monica Valente, who's responsible for the Sao Paulo Foro. She will take the floor in the closing ceremony of the forum, and that's it. Tomorrow we will briefly discuss our debate. We don't have enough time to write down something for tomorrow, but anyway, this forum of the European left is trying to mimic Latin America. We'll try to follow your example and we'll hope that we get to uh, Sao Paulo Forum and hopefully next year. I'm sure that we will meet again, but we will meet many times in between. Thank you very much. Thank you also to the interpreters. Thank you all. Thank you to the office and technical support staff. Thank you. Thank you everyone and see you soon.